While urban sprawl continues to wipe out green spaces across the planet, rooftops offer nearly unlimited plantable space to do so many great things for the planet. Today, we'll get a behind the scenes tour of Chicago's most famous and largest rooftop garden at Chicago's City Hall. And then it's on to a neighboring rooftop garden that's one of the largest in the world to explore its beauty and possibilities. And Chef Nathan Lyon cooks up a favorite rooftop vegetable, tomatoes, on the dish of the week. All that and more today on Growing a Greener World. I just love Chicago, don't you? Awesome. This program was funded by the following. Fiskars designs ergonomic products that empower gardeners to accomplish their goals. At Fiskars, we believe that all things, even the simplest, can be made better and smarter. This program is sponsored in part by Burpee Home Gardens, providing garden-ready vegetable and herb plants, backed by the 125-year heritage of Burpee. Available at your local garden center. At Live with Bents, we work in harmony with nature to help protect your garden, your family, and your pets with all natural, environmentally friendly animal repellents and lawn and garden products. Live with Bents, all natural products to help you address some of nature's most difficult problems. At Subaru, we care about preserving the environment. That's why we build our vehicles in zero landfill plants, which produce less landfill waste in a year than a single family household in a day. Subaru, a proud sponsor of Growing a Greener World. One of the biggest opportunities to lower our carbon footprint is to plant green roofs. They're rapidly gaining popularity in commercial and even residential design. Besides offering a welcomed respite, they do so many great things to improve our environment. In the progressive city of Chicago, Mayor Richard Daly caught the vision of a green top city hall, and in September of 2000, the mayor installed the first of many plants to come. Today, this 20,000 square foot garden atop the 11 story city hall is not only beautiful, but a showcase for the possibilities and benefits of rooftop gardening. So Suzanne, the famous rooftop garden on yeah. Chicago's City Hall. I feel privileged to be here. Well, we're glad you're here. It's a wonderful place to celebrate green, isn't it? It really is. Give me the overview of what we're looking at right here. Well, this is a 20,000 square foot garden that was installed in 2001 uh, as a result of Mayor Daly's interest in putting green roofs on. Uh, came back from a trip in Germany, and here we go. Most of it is only three to six inches deep. Uh, we only have 18 inches deep where the trees are, so a lot of species, both native and non-native, and they're all pretty happy, as you can see. They're very happy. So I know being the mayor gives you a certain amount of latitude to you know, ask for something and sometimes it comes through, but this is not just this sort of minor garden. You said he wanted a green roof and we have this. Yeah. But there's got to be more behind it. Well, there is. I think the mayor, of course, just loves green. So he's been mayor for 21 years. Uh, he was talking about environment and climate and things like that long before a lot of other cities were. And while budgets go up and down, he never came back, never backed up from our Bureau of Forestry, for instance, our landscape work. And I think everybody understands the beauty of it, but he also understands and really encourages us to really focus on air quality, stormwater management, habitat, all those types of things together. So from green on the ground to green on the top to green in our buildings, all those things are part of what we're trying to do for our environment in Chicago. But when we put a garden like this in, this is a very extensive project. You just don't tell your crew to go out there and put some plants on the roof. There's a lot involved. There's a lot of design involved. So any green roof, you got to make sure that it has structural soundness. you got to make sure it can take a lot of water. Um, and then in this, if you looked at the insides of it, it looks like an egg carton. So it has all these different layers of materials. The soil is extremely light. Uh, and then we just have... Um, soaker hoses throughout the site, but it's only three to six inches deep in most of this site with a very light material, but you have to design it right, it has to drain correctly, uh, you need to make sure that the plants are going to have the best chance they can. Well, let's go take a look at some of these other plants because there's a lot more than what we see right here. Sounds good. Yeah. 
What I find really appealing here is the mounded effect. You know, that's something you want in any good design, but here you wouldn't do that with all soil because that would put way too much weight on the structure. That's right. Really, the soil here is just three to six inches. Underneath, we have a range of different drainage layers, uh, and that way it's all held in place. It looks great, um, but it doesn't have that extra weight that wouldn't be viable on a roof. And on a roof, there are pretty much two types of designs, an intensive and an extensive, right? That's right. Most of our, our garden here is extensive. Again, that's the three to six inches of soil. Um, and that's what you're going to do mostly in your roofs, again, because of the weight, the water. Our intensive sites, there's only two of them on the site, which is two trees, and they have about 18 inches of soil. Got it. Now, as far as the plants, the roofs are pretty much an inhospitable environment no matter where you are. That's right. How do you go about selecting the plants that you put here? Well, we really wanted to use the prairie plants. People thought we were a little nuts because they thought, how can that happen with three to six inches of soil? But we did use them, and we found that a lot of them did well, especially when they typically need eight to ten feet. So we've got rattlesnake master, we have liatris, big blue stem, uh, queen of the prairie. Uh, we have a lot of great species here, and they seem to be just loving it just fine. And you have plenty of native plants. That's right, and that's what we wanted to demonstrate. And so not only can we have a great place for insects, uh, but it's birds that come by, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. The underlying plant, though, that seems to weave the whole thing together, no matter where you go in a rooftop garden, sedum. That's right. It's, it's the miracle plant. You absolutely need it. It's a succulent, so it can handle the drought. Uh, it overwinters really, really well. Um, but you know you put it in, it's going to hold down the erosion. It's going to be the great baseline for everything, and then the plants can kind of pop up in between. Yeah, just like they're doing here. That's right. I know when people see green roofs and rooftop gardens like this, they become very inspired and you know, they sort of want to do that themselves, if possible. Now beyond the structural integrity, that's a big thing of course, but I think they never get there because they think cost is a prohibitive issue every time. Absolutely, and that's a, that's a big concern on anything people do that's environmentally responsible, but the reality is that incremental increase in cost up front pays for itself many times over. When you look at the long-term costs of maintaining a roof, Green roofs double the, the life of your roof Yeah. because you don't have as much wear and tear. Yeah. Same thing with green buildings and everything else we do that's green infrastructure. So it's a cost saving long haul. Sometimes that upfront cost is a little scary, but it's completely worth it for the long term. Well, it's like they say, you can pay me now or pay me later. Exactly. So you have the hard cost savings and then you also have, of course, all the environmental benefits of doing what you do. And that, to me, is even more important than the out-of-pocket expense. On top of that, you have an improved quality of life as a result. So I think it's a win-win. Yeah. As we've been walking around here, one of the observations I noted to myself was that, you know, we're in the dead of summer here and we're on a rooftop, but, you know, I'm not sweating as much as I would think I would be. That's right. Well, green roofs definitely have that cooling capacity. So we've done some studies on this. It shows that on a 74 degree overcast day, this roof is 74 degrees. Yeah. A black tar roof, 156 degrees. Even a high um, albedo, highly reflective white roof, 105 to 110 degrees. So they definitely have a benefit in cooling, and when you're in a city, a suburb doesn't matter where, you need that opportunity in a city. And reducing the heat island effect was one of Mayor Daly's primary motivations for even putting in the green roof, but it's not just that. There are a lot of other benefits too. Talk about some of them, such as runoff. Absolutely. Well, stormwater is really important. So about 70% of a one-inch rain gets captured here on this city roof, and it happens all over the city. So imagine what happens on a big storm. It would be even worse if you didn't have something to capture it. So that, um, certainly grabbing the particulate matter, the pollutants, yeah. uh, has a huge impact as well. And then it gives us all this clean air that we're happy to breathe. And plants are famous for that. And you guys are certainly leading the way. And I want to commend you and Mayor Daly and the City of Chicago for all that you're doing to really help grow a greener world. Thanks a bunch. So rooftop gardens can be really diverse, from elaborate designs like Chicago's City Hall down to basic themes. But there's one thing they all have in common, and that's the work that goes on underneath the surface, that part that you don't see. So to learn more about that, we caught up with one of the top authorities in the country, Ed Snodgrass. He has a nursery that supplies plants for rooftop gardens. He's the author of several books, and we caught up with him today in Charlotte, North Carolina, on the rooftop garden of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. About. 12 years ago, we started the first green roof nursery in North America, and things were a little slow at first, but we're finding now that uh, the demand is really picking up, primarily in urban areas uh, and the denser areas of cities, and uh, the primary drivers are stormwater management and building energy savings, and on a more global level, the urban heat island effect, attenuating the effect of the urban heat island. Uh, and you're seeing a movement, I think, in the design community from 
what I would call more traditional mechanical solutions to these problems and more public money addressing these problems to uh, more living systems. And a green roof is an example of a living system solving a number of problems simultaneously. I mean, the beauty about nature is it does a whole bunch of things at once and it does most of them for free. So compared to an air conditioner in a building which just air conditions or a tank underground which just collects stormwater, the green roof collects the stormwater, it air conditions, it provides habitat for these bees here in the background. Um, it reduces the temperature going into the air handling system for the building. So it does all these things simultaneously. That's the beauty of living systems. What the green roof does is essentially, it's like putting a sponge on top of a building. If you have a, a, a known pipe, a known diameter of pipe, it holds only so much water. And, and really the problem in, in stormwater is not how much rain you're getting, but how fast you're getting it. So you can have a very short rain in a city, 15, 20 minutes, especially here in the Carolinas, where a lot of rain comes in a very short amount of time and it's all running off the building very quickly. What will happen with a green roof like this one is this green roof at four inches thick, about the first half inch of rain won't leave the roof at all and after that it's going to leave an hour or two later. So it's going to leave the roof when the pipe is empty again. So it's a way of reducing what they call the peak load of the storm event and that's the big, big benefit for green roofs. And when you get enough of them in a city, it has a huge effect. So um, I, I think it's, um, it's part of civil engineering. It's a new, there's a new generation of civil engineers who are looking at this kind of stuff and saying, well, there's a different way to skin this cat. So you're thinking you might want that green roof on your roof. Well, it's not quite as simple as just throwing plants on top of the surface and leave it to a guy like Ed to actually have a model of what takes place underneath the plants. So Ed, walk us through what we have here. Okay, the first thing to think about if you want a green roof is that this, which is your roofing deck, which is either plywood or metal on most buildings, can support the additional load that you're putting on your roof. So that's the first question. Don't put something on your roof that could cause structural damage. And the way you find that out is through a structural engineer. Structural engineer, architect. If you're doing new construction, it's easy because you just build for it. Yeah. And I would say a good many roofs have that, but you don't want to guess, okay? You don't want to find out you after You don't want to find out the wrong way, yeah. <laughs> uh, the second thing is to waterproof your building. So you're not talking about roofing shingles now. You're talking about more uh, waterproofing. Like Kind of like a liner to a pond. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That kind of then the insulation on some buildings is above the waterproofing. Uh, on some other buildings, it would be like on a house, it would probably be under the deck. But there would be insulation. You can get an additional benefit by putting it there. Then there's a drainage course of some kind. So this allows the water to get out of the growth media and horizontally to a drain, whether that's a gutter and downspout or a scupper or a central drain system, whatever your draining system is, it works on any roofing system. So it doesn't, any drain system would work. And then you would have growth media, and I'm saying growth media and not dirt. Yes. So this is an engineered system. All this is, is very engineered. And the growth media is especially made for green roofs because it stays light, Yes. drains well. And uh, so this is, don't skimp on your, on the soil part of the system. If you put up field soil from your yard, you can say, oh, Joe says to me, I got great soil in my backyard, I'll throw that up there. But it has silt particles in it that can clog up the system and then you're ponding and adding weight and having horticultural problems. So this is, this is the engine that can here. This is the little <laughs> engine that can grow plants. And then at the top, you're probably not gonna put these plastic plants in we have in the model, but real plants like the ones on the roof here and the plants are chosen relative to what you want your green roof to do, mm -hmm. what your design intent is, and the available root zone that you have, how many inches of media you have, and is it sun or shade, how much you want to garden, all the kind of things that are normal gardening questions. Back to the right plant, right place. Right plant, right place, and, and, and actually on a roof, which is always going to be harder to get to than something on the ground, another design question is, 
how much time do you want to spend in maintenance? Mm. So that, that drives plant selection also. Probably not as much as uh, anywhere else in your garden. It's really appealing the first year and maybe not so appealing in subsequent years to climb up there. But it is, they are a great deal of fun. All I do is green roof, so I wouldn't do it if I didn't think there was some fun in it. Great. Pop quiz. What do rooftop gardens and parking garages have in common? Well, you're about to find out as we head back to Chicago. Michigan Avenue is known for its huge skyscrapers and beautiful views of Lake Michigan. But there's also an amazing garden built right on a rooftop. Lori Garden sits within a 24 acre plus center for world class art, music, and of course, landscape design. The most amazing thing about this park and garden, it's sitting atop a series of underground parking garages. With such a world class attraction, it takes just the right person to oversee the details. Jennifer Davitt is the director here at Lori. Jennifer, you have an amazing job. This garden is so beautiful and it's really unique looking. What are some of the unique aspects of the garden? Thanks, Patty. Yes, the Lurie is a unique garden. It was designed as the result of an international design competition. So landscape architects from all over the world submitted their ideas and Gustav and Guthrie Nickel, a firm out of Washington State, won the award. So we have a, a really amazing design that provides four season interest in the garden. Um, Pete Oldoff actually did the planting design. And so he chose plants that grew well together and looked interesting together throughout the four seasons. And he really focused on texture in addition to color. So we have a great garden that provides a lot of interest and is really well designed. People can come here and learn design principles that they can apply into their own garden. There are also a lot of um, native plants here, so they do well kind of with the seasons. Right, we have a lot of native plants and also non-natives. Both of them are, were chosen because they do really well in our climate. They don't need a lot of water, don't need a lot of fertilizer, so they're ideal plants for creating a sustainable garden that's pretty low maintenance. Awesome. All right, so how about a rooftop garden that maybe you can relate a little bit better to? Well, how about this place? It's called Uncommon Ground. They're a restaurant right here in Chicago, but their real claim to fame, the first certified organic rooftop farm in the entire country. That's right, farm. That's because they don't have a certification for garden yet. But here's what we've got. About 2,000 square feet of deck surface, about 640 square feet of plantable area, but boy, do they have a lot going on. They've got the beans right here and the peppers over there, and then look at all these tomatoes. If you think that possibly you've got an area that doesn't have enough room outside or maybe not enough sunlight, look up to your roof because it might be the perfect place for you to grow your favorite vegetables too, like, ah, uh, these sun gold tomatoes. Mmm, delicious. Mmm, love these. Mmm, mmm, mmm. You know, I love midsummer tomatoes and even more so beautiful heirlooms because the flavors are unbelievable and they're totally, totally different. Now, one thing about heirloom tomatoes, you don't really want to cook them. You really want to savor the natural sweetness of the heirloom. That's why I'm making this amazing heirloom salad with mozzarella and homemade croutons. Really simple, guys. So let's get started on this homemade croutons. Take this beautiful piece of fresh bread. Just cut it right in half. Now I'm going to cut the crust off Save them later on, because you never know. Homemade breadcrumbs are delicious. And in fact, if you want my recipe for homemade breadcrumbs, growingagreenerworld.com, check that out. Cut this off. All right, now you're gonna save these, put them off to the side. All right, now I'm gonna hand tear these pieces into about one inch by one inch pieces into this big bowl. And there we go. You know what, stale bread works just fine for this as well. A little bit of extra virgin olive oil. We're actually gonna season our own croutons 
And homemade croutons are so much better than the kind you get from the store. The kind you get from the store is so hard, there's nothing really enjoyable about that. Olive oil, kosher salt, and a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. Give them a quick toss. And that's it, onto a sheet pan. And I have the oven preheated 400 degrees. And we'll just toast them on up until the insides are a little bit soft and the outsides are nice and crunchy. There we go. All right, now onto the salad. Really simple. Just clean up the space and here we go. The first thing I wanna make is this vinaigrette. Pretty easy as well. Grab a few cloves of garlic, and we're gonna finely chop this. All right, and into this large bowl they go. How about a little bit of shallot? I like the natural sweetness, a little bit of bite that shallot has to offer. I'm gonna mince this. Now, I'm gonna add a touch of balsamic vinegar to that right now, because if you eat raw garlic, it's a little bit too harsh, but add some vinegar to it, and it mellows the whole thing out. Here we are. And we'll whisk in some olive oil, and our vinaigrette is ready. All right, there we go. Now, when you have a large party coming over, like I do tonight, you can actually make the vinaigrette in the bottom of a large bowl, and we'll put the lettuce, right now we're doing arugula, on top of the dressing. You just don't wanna mix it, and that's okay. It saves a little bit of storage, okay? And now, these beautiful little cherry tomatoes are fantastic. We can cut some of them in half, and some, you know, leave whole. And the rest is so easy. This is where a lot of the complimentary flavors and smells come from to really make those heirloom tomatoes shine. First, we have this fresh oregano that I grow pretty much year round right in my windowsill. And we'll just pick that just like this. Really simple. Next, midsummer, nothing better than fresh basil, guys. We're just gonna hand tear that also. There we are. And a little bit of flat leaf Italian parsley. Same thing, just tear it on up. And now comes the heirloom tomatoes. Be really careful when slicing these because they're very, very delicate. I like to show off the color as well, so I'll core it and just really thinly slice it. All right, believe it or not, it's time to plate it up. Summer dinners, so easy, and the salad could not be more delicious. Here we are. Now it's time to go ahead and mix this salad up. Like that. Some fresh mozzarella. Who knows about mozzarella and fresh tomatoes? There we are. So every bite has the natural sweetness of those heirloom tomatoes, a little bit of the uh, fresh basil, the oregano, we have the parsley, and of course, extra virgin olive oil right over top. And there we are. A really fast summer night salad. Perfect for any meal. Enjoy. From downtown buildings to bungalows, there are lots of reasons to install rooftop gardens, including growing your favorite vegetables, like tomatoes. But as we continue to mow down and pave over green space, Green roofs are one significant way to mitigate the repercussions. Just imagine if more cities like here in Chicago took on plans to install rooftop gardens. As we saw today, the benefits are many and the opportunities unlimited. And I can't think of a more beautiful way to take on the challenges of environmental impact. To learn more about rooftop gardens, we've put together some great links and articles on our website. And you can also watch all the episodes, and the address is the same as our name, growingagreenerworld.com. I'm Joe Lample. And I'm Patty Moreno. And we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World. Ugh, I want to stay here all day. Yeah, I think our flight leaves at like <laughs> 6. I think we got a few hours. Yay. <laughs> This program was funded by the following. 
Fiskars designs ergonomic products that empower gardeners to accomplish their goals. At Fiskars, we believe that all things, even the simplest, can be made better and smarter. This program is sponsored in part by Burpee Home Gardens, providing garden-ready vegetable and herb plants, backed by the 125-year heritage of Burpee. Available at your local garden center. At Liquid Fence, we work in harmony with nature to help protect your garden, your family, and your pets with all natural, environmentally friendly animal repellents and lawn and garden products. Liquid Fence, all natural products to help you address some of nature's most difficult problems. At Subaru, we care about preserving the environment. That's why we build our vehicles in zero landfill plants, which produce less landfill waste in a year than a single family household in a day. Subaru, a proud sponsor of growing a greener world. Oh, wow. That is very refreshing. Why did we start here? Great. Oh, Lee, this makes it all worth it. Know that. Two, you know, as we walk around here today, I can't help but forget what it is I want to remember. You can't help, I can't help but, but think about realize. how it's cooler, That's, even though it's you. August. To order the Green Gardener's Guide for information on gardening and living green, for $16.95 plus shipping and handling, visit growingagreenerworld.com slash books. This program is presented by Blue Ridge PBS.